Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. This is the last lecture of week eight and also the last lecture of the class. So what I want to do in this mini lecture is go over some of the very simply simple concepts related to the sensors that are relevant for your breathalyzer case. Those two sensors are going to be a semiconductor sensor as well as a fuel cell based detector. They are kind of specialized examples of some of the things we've talked about with other electrochemical sensors, and I thought it might be useful if you heard me at least kind of go through them quickly. So a semiconductor sensor is an interesting thing, um, and what it basically consists of is a porous layer. Think of it as kind of sand that's been all glommed together. And what you're doing is simply measuring the resistance or the conductance across that film of sintered sand. And in this case, it's not sand, it's usually going to be tin oxide. You're going to be heating up the tin oxide so that it acts as somewhat of a conductor. Tin oxide is a wide band gap semiconductor, and it doesn't conduct electricity great, but it does a little bit. And that's good because if it was a metal and conducted it too well, you wouldn't see changes because of the absorption of gas. And if it was an insulator, it wouldn't conduct electricity at all. So you almost always want a semiconductor. And you need to be at high temperatures because you need to promote enough carriers up to something called the conduction band so you do get enough kind of baseline current. So you need the, the system to be somewhat conductive, even in the absence of your analyte. So you put a gas over it. And if we zoomed in to this sort of pile of wet sand that was our, was our electrode, what we would see is that there would be necks or places where the tin oxides touched each other. And in fact, because they had been heat treated, they would be centered. So there literally would be a connecting point. And the ethanol would go and stick on that connecting point. And not just ethanol, but any molecule that had some kind of dipole moment. So it's kind of got the selectivity of chromatography. You'd see methanol stick, you'd see anything with the carbonyl peak, anything that's polar would tend to absorb to that surface. And when it absorbed, it would influence the number of electrons that were conducting the charge. So if you think about a semiconductor as basically kind of like a super highway that electrons are moving back and forth on and conducting, then what happens when something binds to the surface of it is that in that surface region, you're going to add extra electrons or take away electrons. And you're going to influence then the conductivity of the system because of that effect of surface doping. And whether it takes away or contributes electrons has a lot to do with the gas of interest. But something like ethanol is going to contribute electrons to the system. It's not exactly a redox process. It's a little bit more subtle than that. And it only requires that the gas be physically adsorbed to the surface in some fashion. So what you can see immediately then is as you put more ethanol on the surface, you're going to have more carriers to conduct and you're going to see the conductivity increase. And that's an interesting observation because that would be a way, of course, to deduce the amount of ethanol. Uh, and of course, one of the challenges is that not just ethanol, but acetone and methanol and pretty much any gas that's got kind of that sort of dipole moment um, is going to bind in a similar way and have a similar influence on the electrical characteristics of this particular sand. You might also see why it's good to have these necks or these very thin regions, because if charge is flowing through a big slab that's, I don't know, a millimeter single crystal, and you've done something to the surface of it, then if you've got, I don't know, 10 to the 20 charge carriers, and you've only influenced a little tiny bit at the interface, you're not going to see that effect. But if you have a nanoscale material, and you've either charge depleted or charge donated at an interface that's, let's say, 50 nanometers, and your whole thickness is 300 nanometers, you're going to have a big effect on conductivity. So one of the other features of semiconductor sensors is either they're extremely thin, thin films, or they're basically made to be very high surface area so that when you do bind gases and you do influence conductivity, it's a big fraction of the total charge carriers that are present and moving through the system. Now, here's some schematics of what's called the Taguchi sensor, which is the basis for most of these. So the number one advantage for the semiconductor ethanol sensors is that they are cheap, really, really cheap. These are literally what you see. They're like little tiny LEDs. You can plug them directly into circuits that cost about five bucks. And what they consist of is over here on the left is the ceramic tube, which is really the guts of the sensor. And it requires that you heat. You have to have a heater coil. These will run about 300 C. That's what I've seen in most of the manuals. And the ethanol goes into this tube. It binds. And when it does that, it changes the conductance. And of course, that's what you measure. 
Now, this whole little assembly fits inside of this larger um, device structure. And that piece is shown right here, the sensor element. And so it's very, very small, very compact, and less than $10. And as the ethanol or whatever's in the vapor that's going over the sensor changes, you see a change in the conductivity. And you can immediately see the big disadvantages I pointed out before is that depending on what the end rate is, anything that has a CO dipole moment is going to bind to the surface similarly and have a similar impact on conductivity. So it's not a very specific measurement, and that's really its limitation. Because if you get pulled over for, let's say, a policeman and they want to know if you're drunk and let's say you have a lot of ketone in your breath or you just had, you know, something to eat that could be interfering with the ethanol, then you would have a real problem if you applied this particular sensor. So a better option, a much more expensive option, is the fuel cell. So the fuel cell is an interesting type of ampere metric measurement. And in the fuel cell sensor, what you're doing is you're using ethanol basically as a fuel for a fuel cell. And it's getting oxidized. And in that process, it's developing a current that you then measure. So at the end of the day, you're measuring a current in the fuel cell. But it's through a, a fuel cell process in which the ethanol is actually undergoing a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction has to be catalyzed by the presence of platinum. And so this system is a much more complicated kind of device structure than the one we just saw because, first off, it involves the use of an expensive catalyst, namely platinum. Second of all, in order to have this work, it's really critical because when you oxidize the ethanol, you're going to create protons and electrons. And if they both flow together to the cathode, in a cathode, you're not going to get anything. But if only one of them flows, then the other one can go out and be used as what's called a load or create a current on the system. And so this electrolyte in the middle needs to basically transport only protons and no electrons. And it turns out there are materials that do that. And so you can think of this as a very specialized sponge because it only lets the cations um, go towards the cathode. And that, in effect, drives a current, which is the output of the fuel cell. The other thing that ends up happening is you get an oxygen to water conversion at the cathode, so you produce water from the fuel cell as well. So this is a kind of blown up diagram of a proton exchange membrane fuel cell that I just sort of wanted to go through so you understood in a different, more specific view how these things work. So everywhere it says hydrogen, just imagine it was ethanol. The only difference is it's a lot less efficient, so a lot of the ethanol doesn't react, and of course, um, you have the platinum to contend with. Uh, but you have the platinum also for the hydrogen, so it's just an important um, electro-oxidative catalyst generally. So anyhow, you're going to flow your gas through a system, and you're going to have an oxidant or air going through the other side of your system. And at the anode, the platinum catalyst will cause the hydrogen to split, or in this case, it's going to oxidize your ethanol. It's going to create hydrogen ions and negatively charged electrons. They're going to transport but remember, the electrons can't transport through the polyelectrolyte membrane because it only transports protons or positive cations. So that's going to force the current. You can think of it as forcing the electrons to basically drive a current. And you're going to have the protons going through the cell. And then at the cathode, where everything meets up, you're going to form water because you're going to have the oxidant coming in to form a uh, the water, and that will flow out of the cell. So it's a pretty classic fuel cell setup. And whether it's ethanol or water, it's going to look a lot like this. So a key component is a polyelectrolyte barrier. And I thought you might be a little curious about what it is. So it's a sponge. It, literally, you can think of it a lot like a sponge. And it's made of a pretty fascinating polymer called naphion, typically. Naphion's an ionomer. So what that means is it's a polymer that carries an enormous amount of charge because there's a lot of charge groups hanging off of its polymer backbone. In this case, the backbone is much like Teflon. And the charges are somehow transported by sulfonate head groups in which the protons kind of hop between the sulfonates in a very effective way. And so Nafion is well known for having very, very high proton conductivities. And a lot of people are studying how the structure of Nafion coupled with the chemistry of the sulfonate group make that possible. So putting it all together into the fuel cell then that you might care about if you're thinking about measurement of ethanol. 
So the ethanol fuel cell then is going to be a lot more complicated than the semiconductor gas center sensor, which is a bunch of packed powder of tin oxide that's been heated a little bit. It's going to it's going to have this fancy naphion polymer in the middle. It's got to have some platinum in it. It's going to have two different electrodes. It's going to have a current measurement device. And you can read here about the specifics of what's going on for the ethanol. But the number one thing that it provides that the semiconductor one doesn't is actually much more specificity. Because for the ethanol to participate in this reaction requires that the free energy of the ethanol be high enough that it can be oxidized under these conditions. And that's going to be pretty specific. Not every substance is going to have, the, you know, want to be oxidized enough that it's going to be subjected to being a fuel for a fuel cell. In fact, fuels for fuel cells are hard to come by. So um, other options like acetone are going to be far less efficient at generating current as opposed to ethanol. And other substances, let's say like hydrogen, are unlikely to be something that you exhale <laughs> in your breath. So in that sense, this particular methodology is sensitive to the electrochemical potential of the incoming gas, which is a much more stringent separator of, you know, distinguishing feature of molecules than, for example, whether or not they stick to a 10 oxide surface or not, which is pretty much just a, a rough measure of polarity. So the fuel cells are going to have a specificity built into them that many, that the gas sensors do not. And as you're going to see, as we already talked about, the infrared is perhaps even more specific because it's actually using the structural elements of ethanol to identify it. In any case, it's an intermediate option. It's certainly more expensive than a $10, you know, breathalyzer that you might get for your iPhone. But nevertheless, it's still electrochemical. It has to be calibrated. You have to worry about um, how the electrodes degrade over time, their lifetime issues. So like any electroanalytical technique, it's a little bit tricky to implement. But as you'll see, it's accepted as an evidentiary standard. And fuel cell technologies have really come a long ways, particularly for the measurement of ethanol. So some last, so, some last comments about the class, uh, just some cleanups. The last case, case study, I promised three case studies, so I've got to do it because it's written into the grading. It's going to be an online quiz, and you'll have some reading material to do. It'll be fairly light, and it's going to cover a lot of these electroanalytical techniques. I'll be posting a final exam relatively soon. You're going to have 14 days to complete it, and you may also use any of your 30-day late days um, to extend the deadline for that, as you may have done with other assignments. What that means is the official end date of the class is going to be pretty far in the future, because as soon as I post the final, there's 14 days to complete it, and there will be some people who might have saved up all their late days. So I'm going to have to give them another 30 days before I officially close the class. And finally, this has been a really fun experience for me, if not a lot more time consuming than I had anticipated. Um, it's taught me a lot about teaching, partly because I spent the first six weeks of this class without a textbook. So I had to do a lot of my own work in thinking through how to explain it and my own visuals. And I think it's also taught me a lot about keeping people's interest, because normally when you lecture in a college setting, people have paid very good money to be in your class. And you're more concerned with conveying the information to them in a compact, concise way. And in this setting, I found that, you know, you didn't have to listen if you didn't want to. And so there's an element of how do you engage and keep people interested in the topic. And that I found to be a really compelling way to think about my teaching and something that's going to actually probably make me a better lecturer when I go back to the traditional classroom now. In any case, thanks for sticking it out in the first time. All of you have had a lot to do with making this class better, uh, and your comments and patience on the forums have really meant a lot to me. Anyhow, happy analyzing, and hope to see you around at Coursera some other time.